Friends, grace and peace, good morning. good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church. If you are a guest among us, welcome to this place. Uh, no matter if you've been here forever or just showed up, uh, there are welcome pads at the ends of the pews. If you would pass them down, uh, sign your name, let us know that you're here, welcome each other by name, we would appreciate that. A couple of things to let you know of. Uh, next week begins the July sermon series. I already checked the box. There are lots of questions there. Um, Carol and I haven't peeked yet, so it really will be a surprise. So uh, there are cards in the narthex and there are cards in the atrium. We invite you to write your question or your topic down, throw it in the box, and then tomorrow morning um, we're going to draw and we'll see what we're dealing with next Sunday. So good stuff there. Um, also, I've been asked to note... Uh, Prayer Shawl Ministry is set to meet this Wednesday. The bulletin says 4 o'clock. Don't come at 4. You're going to be two hours early. Um, so change that to 6. So you need to be here at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. All right. Um, and then lastly, in your bulletins, you should have the insert for the July birthdays. Um, first, happy birthday to all those folks. Um, second, a handy reminder that within our own foundation, there is the birthday fund. Um, that was established many, many years ago, um, help established by Jim Crawley, whose life we celebrated just last week. Um, but every year of your birth, that's a dollar. You write a check, you send it to the foundation, and that goes on to continue the mission and the ministry of this church for uh, generations to come. So, uh, glad you're here in worship today. You finally came. We're going to finish Jonah today, I promise, and we'll be done with him for a good long while. So, it's a good day for worship. Welcome. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God this day. As we gather for worship, let us stand in body or in spirit and call ourselves to worship this morning. 
Welcome this day to the house of our God. Welcome this day to our community of faith. Welcome this day to the worship of our Creator. Friends, together, through jumbled words, let us worship Holy. We gather together in worship recognizing that we all make mistakes from as small as a uh, misspelling in the bulletin uh, to yelling at people in traffic to far worse. We've all been there. You don't have to hit your spouse. It's okay. Friends, we come together and we acknowledge the places where we have fallen short. And so in a moment of silent confession, let us confess our sins to God and then join together with the prayer in the bulletin. Let us pray. praying God who is all wise and all knowing you have searched us and known us you have looked into the deepest parts of our hearts you know our doubts and our fears and still you love us we have been wayward we have fled from your presence we have run to the far side of the sea and still you come looking for us Forgive us, O oh God, wrap us in your mercy and love, and renew our hearts to follow you. In the name of Christ, we Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn us? But only Christ. And Christ came to this world to show us a better way, to show us the path of love, to forgive our sins and unite us with God forever. Know that our sins are forgiven. And let us be at peace.
Being assured of God's love and forgiveness towards us then enables us to turn outwards and to share that forgiveness and love with one another. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that with one another. The reading, the reading today is from Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Listen for the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. 
and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Young disciples, let's come on down. Let's sit down. Good morning, friends. Good morning. I have a question. Do y'all ever, do you ever get angry? Yes. No? No, we never get angry. Yes. Collins, have you ever been angry? Gotten mad? No? Oh, yes. Yeah. So there are things that, is there anything you can think of that makes you mad? Hmm. Bad drivers. That's a good one. Bad drivers make me mad. Yeah. When I don't get a good night's sleep, that kind of makes me mad. Stuck on a game level you cannot beat. Absolutely. These are things that make us mad. But what do we do? What do we do when we get mad? We find ways to calm down. Absolutely. Well, we're at the end of the story of Jonah. And I'll tell you what else makes me mad is I feel like it ends on a cliffhanger because it ends with Jonah still being mad. Yes. You need a tissue? Okay. I bet we can go find one. Okay. (laughs) All right. Awesome. Joshua, you help her find a tissue. Perfect. Thank you. But Jonah is still mad because God sent Jonah on a special mission. Jonah didn't want to do it. And then he does it, and God forgives the people, and this makes Jonah mad. And he doesn't really have any right to be mad about this because he's like, I knew you would forgive them because you're a loving and merciful God. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of what you're to do is to go and tell God, tell people about God's love, right? But he's still mad about it, and that's how the story of Jonah ends. It's with Jonah still mad. But the good news is that God still loves everyone. And that's the story of Jonah is God is merciful and loving. And even when we are angry and do things we shouldn't do, God still loves us. Hey, buddy. Perfect. (laughs) Come on back down here. I know. It's so exciting up there. I get that 100%. All right. Well, let's pray, friends. We're going to pray. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us even when we get angry and maybe do things that we think is right but you know is better. May we just listen for you and all that we do and say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we say, may the Lord be with you. All right, well, Molly summed it up well. That's it. We can all go home. Uh, No, so yeah, uh, past four weeks we've been dealing with Jonah, right? Just to recount, God says to his prophet Jonah, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. I need you to tell them that uh, they have some things to work on. He says, heck no, see you later. Gets on a boat, tries to flee. What happens? 
Oh my, okay, we've been doing this four weeks now. I expect a little bit better. What happens? A storm comes, good, and they all get scared, and Jonah gets thrown overboard, and then what happens? The fish, good, we do remember that piece, right? The fish spits him back up right outside of Nineveh's gates. Uh, he's still pretty mad, and God says, listen, I really need you to commit uh, to do this assignment. Uh, and he does it, and what happens? It works. It works, and everybody repents. Um, today, we finally get to the last part, chapter 4, the aftermath of repentance. So, let's get into it. Jonah, we're actually going to start uh, chapter 3, verse 10, and then we'll finish uh, chapter 4. So let's listen again for a word from God this day. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior, and so God stopped planning to destroy them, and God did not do it. But Jonah thought that this was utterly wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Come on, Lord! Wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. Because I know that you are a merciful and you are a compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love and willing not to destroy. At this point, Lord, you may as well take my life from me because it would be better for me to die than to live. And then the Lord responded, Jonah, is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and he sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a shrub and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub. But God provided a worm the next day at dawn and it attacked the shrub so that it would die. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, it's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, is your anger about the shrub a good thing? And Jonah said, yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, you pitied a shrub for which you did not work, which you did not raise. It grew in at night and it died in a night. Yet for my part, can I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and there are also many animals. That's the end of Jonah. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Growing up, I had a lot of chores in my house. My favorite chore, though, I loved getting the paper for my dad. After throwing on my school uniform in the morning, consisting of khaki pants and a blue button-down, I would race out the front door down the sidewalk and snatch the morning's rolled up paper off the wet grass before the dew had a chance to soak my leather loafers. There was something refreshing about that morning ritual of getting my dad's paper, of watching him slide that thin green rubber band off the roll, of unfolding the newsprint, taking sips of coffee in his white pharmacy coat before finally rushing us off to school. I'm sure at some point in my childhood, I imagined myself at that table, waiting for my child to bolt out the door, snagging the morning paper, sliding the green rubber band off the roll, unfolding the newsprint, taking sips of coffee before rushing my own children off to school. It hasn't quite worked out that way, though. Uh, for one, I don't drink coffee, uh, but I also don't take the paper either. I know many of you all still do. I don't. You still enjoy that morning ritual for yourselves, 
But for me, these days, my morning news reports come across my computer screen. Glancing through the Norman Transcript website, or as is more often the case, on their Facebook page. The Facebook page is where the real news exists, because not only are the articles linked there for you to read if you have a paid subscription, but there's also a very active chat feature. There's a place at the bottom of the post where anyone and everyone can share their thoughts and feelings related to the subject or not. In just the past week, here are some of the headlines that the Norman Transcript has shared. Norman Public Schools buys land for Norman North Football Stadium. Council considers possible permanent location for homeless shelter. Stove Wars, that's pretty catchy, Stove Wars. Republican-controlled House approves bill to protect gas stoves. And Oklahoma Turnpike Authority tells state high court turnpike routes can change. And, as you can probably imagine, none of these posts are without their fair share of commentary. People writing to tell the OTA to pike off, or arguing about homelessness in the city, or wondering if paying teachers would be a better use of public school funds than a new football field. Each headline creating a small bit of controversy which can be commented on and debated and it's not just in our little town newspaper either this has become the dominating technique of news outlets for several years now scott galloway professor of marketing at nyu stern school of business says enragement equals engagement if i can enrage you then you're more likely to come back to my website or news channel or platform. And so the algorithms that run these sites amp up the crazy and intentionally make us angry. Galloway continues his comments by saying, in this way, we have all been turned into Tyrannosaurus Rexes, where we are attracted to anger and to violence. If only Jonah had been born a few thousand years into the future, I think he most likely would have had his very own cable news show today. Because while for the past two weeks we've actually seen a softer side of Jonah, one that relents and repents when faced with the stark reality of death and who finally gives in to God's request to go to Nineveh, today it appears that we are right back to the Jonah we first met several weeks ago, the Jonah that we all know and loathe, the man that Tim Mackey has called a horrible, grumpy, selfish, hateful man, all of which is on full display here on the east side of Nineveh. After the king of Assyria declared a total season of repentance, complete fasting, sackcloth wearing and ash sitting for every man, woman, child, and animal in the entire empire, Jonah begins to make his way out of the city. His job is done. He said what he was supposed to say. It worked, but he isn't really happy about it. As he passes by all the repentant sinners, he can start to feel his chest tighten, his face growing hot, his fists clenching, his breath shortening, and he begins to grumble to himself, I knew it. I just knew this would happen. God is way too merciful. God is too compassionate. This God is just way too kind. God is blinded by love, and quite frankly, God is just plain soft on sin. The more he thinks about it, the more worked up he gets, the more angry he becomes until finally he shouts to the heavens, Come on, God! You've got to be kidding me. What was the point? I ran away, I got thrown overboard, I almost died, I got eaten by a fish, I said what you wanted me to say, all so that you would forgive them. All so that all of this would be okay? And from the heavens comes a cool and collected response. Jonah, sweet Jonah, is your anger a good thing? 
the kind of response that only angers Jonah even more because, yes, of course it's a good thing. The Ninevites were cruel, hateful, horrible people. They and the rest of their empire were brutal in conquering and subjugating nations. They murdered hundreds of thousands of innocent people. They exiled thousands more. They impaled, flayed, dismembered, crucified those they captured. They ground the bones of their enemies to dust so that all memory of them would be erased. And then, after all the killing, then they had their craftsmen build a 60-mile-long wall encircling Nineveh with every one of their torture and murder techniques carved into it. These are terrible people. So when God asks the question, is your anger a good thing, Jonah is perfectly justified to shout, absolutely. Because as Korean scholar Dr. Justin Ryu explains, as long as the oppression and its painful memories are ongoing, how can the victims hide their anger? And it would have been perfectly fine and justified if that's where Jonah had left it. But he takes it a step further. He steps over the line from righteous anger to blind enragement. And being so angry with God's decision to spare the Ninevites, he cries out, Lord, it would just be better for me to die than to live. And in essence, what Jonah is saying is that his life is only valuable if their lives are not. And I think for the first time in this entire story, for the first time, this is where God truly becomes disappointed in Jonah. When his blind enragement and his toxic disappointment makes him lose sight of the grace and the mercy and the love of God. But it also makes me begin to wonder if this is when God becomes disappointed in us as well. Not for any righteous anger we may have on the part of the oppressed, but rather enragement for its own sake. We've seen it for the past decade or so within our own political discourse, pundits yelling at each other on television, claiming all Democrats do this or all Republicans are that, candidates for office playing to angry mobs and pandering to our worst fears and then complaining when we can't find any common ground to work with. It's that kind of anger that we've seen from across our Christian family when concerns like Abortion and sexuality and immigration become less about people and more about angry litmus tests of loyalty. It's shown up in our own sanctuaries around issues like declining membership and influence and who we will marry and who we will ordain. It's caused brothers and sisters in Christ to become so enraged with one another that schisms have broken out. Splinter denominations have formed, and the body of Christ has been shattered. In his Washington Post op-ed, Ryan McNally Lynn's comments that much of the anger in today's discourse corrodes respect for people's worth. It overreaches beyond the level that is justifiable. This is an anger that can give rise to hatred and the attitude that wishes evil for another. It's a kind of anger that turns issues into us and them, good guys and bad guys. It views other people as threats to be eliminated instead of beloved children of God with whom we just happen to disagree. It's the anger that makes fear the primary lens through which we view the world. And it turns the gospel from a story of love and grace into a filter through which we separate the worthy from the unworthy. Is our anger a good thing? I think like Jonah, there's a case to be made that Yes. Yes, indeed, our anger is a good thing. 
anger with governments that choose to use their citizens as shields. Anger that just this past week, a boat with 750 refugees sunk off the coast of Greece. Anger that a significant portion of our state is still without power. Our anger can indeed be a good thing. But it's when our blind enragement and our toxic disappointment makes us lose sight of the grace and the mercy and the love of God, then it may be time to ask ourselves that holy question. Is this anger a good thing? And as it turns out, it's a question that only we can answer for ourselves. Because the story of Jonah leaves us right there. There are no easy answers. There are no nice and tidy endings to the story. We don't know if Jonah got better or if he just remains a horrible, grumpy, hateful old man. Instead, both we and Jonah are left to wonder for ourselves. Is this anger, is it a good thing? In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Spirit. Amen. We turn our attention now to prayer, at times turning that anger into prayer and that prayer into action. And so I invite you to take a uh, note of those listed on the back of your bulletin of family and friends in need of prayer. Um, I'll also mention, if you'll keep uh, Carol in your prayers, she is in Texas today celebrating the centennial anniversary of her home congregation, um, which is why you're stuck with me for the entirety of this service. So... Uh, Prayers for Carol and for that congregation. Friends, join me as I pray. Holy and eternal God, you meet us where we are and you call us to follow you. This morning we gather and we give you thanks for the beauty of the earth. As summer comes, we thank you for the lengthening of days, the warming of waters, the excitement of children ready for a break. We pray that you might help us to enjoy your creation, and from that place of joy be faithful stewards of the planet and all that sustains us. We give you thanks for the loving community we find here in this community of faith. Strengthen us, we pray. Teach us and empower us to faithful service in the world so that our love may mirror your love and our mercy be your mercy. We praise you, O God, for your care for all your people. Before you rise nations and fall nations and grass withers. Guide the leaders of the world, both nations and states and cities and towns, in the ways of your justice and compassion and mercy. May all who hold positions of authority seek your will, and in so doing, tend to the welfare of all your people. O Lord, we rejoice this morning with those who rejoice, even as we know that the morning does not bring joy for everyone. We pray for your people living through war and violence and oppression. We pray for the homeless and the hungry, the sick and the injured and the grieving, for those who feel alone and are afraid. We pray for immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers and all people on the move. O God, as Jesus reached out and touched the people who came to him for healing, may we also reach out. May our hands be your hands, our feet be your feet. Give us the grace to love and serve, to seek and to listen, to pray and persist 
in righteousness, in grace, in mercy, and in love. For this and so much more, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. With joy and with thanksgiving, let us collect this morning's tithes and offerings as a way of expressing our gratitude to God for the grace that we have received. Let us collect. We know. To you, O God, we give thanks for all the good gifts in our lives, for the gift of music, for the gift of this community, for gifts that sustain us. O Lord, may the gifts we have given today go to serve those in most need of your mercy, of your grace, of your compassion. Use us, O God, we pray. Amen. And now together as a family of faith, let us stand in body or spirit and let us affirm our faith using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. And with one voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. First off, thanks to Dr. David Duty for helping lead music today. Thank you, David. And for Dr. Thomas Dickey, who had a very difficult assignment with Jonah these past few weeks. Well done, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas is also very excited to see what the next four weeks include, each week randomly picking music. It should be good. It'll be good. It'll be good. Uh, birthdays or anniversaries this week? Oh, and hold on, wait, camps, do y'all have an anniversary or is it a birthday? Birthday, all right. Daryl, years together? Oh, just birthday, okay, just birthday. Gan, we're not that old. Gan. All right. Good stuff. All right. Well, oh, oh, who do we have in the back? Hensley's? 17 years. All right. Excellent. Well, let's raise a hand and offer our blessing. Lord God, we give you thanks for these, our friends and family in faith who celebrate this week. Give them all the joy that they can muster as they enjoy each other and enjoy the celebrations they will have. Oh, God, we know that all life is in your hands, and for this we give you thanks. 
Amen. All right, friends, go out into the world. Be kind to one another getting out of the parking lot. Ask if this anger is a good thing. But as you do it, know through the course of Jonah, what we've learned is God is always with us. No matter if we like it or not, God finds us. And thanks be to God for that. Friends, go out into the world knowing that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, you are loved. You are loved by Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who rests with each and every one of us, tonight, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.